expert with uh, Frequency Home Laser. We've uh, done, done some work together, and hopefully you'll uh, enjoy this presentation. Hey, uh, thanks, Mike, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to, as Mike said, talk about some work we've done exploring frequency comb sources and how they can be used for broadband detection of trace gases and, and eventually standoff detection of material on surfaces. Uh, I was going to give you a snapshot of some of the different things, systems we've been looking at in Boulder, both in my group and Scott Didham's group, and there are a number of researchers that have been involved. As you can see here, I won't list all the names, but they've all been uh, heavily involved in different parts of this of uh, the different experiments I'll mention. Uh, we're all out in Boulder where it's actually, it is sunny and warm now too. <laughs> uh, and this work was supported by NIST and, and by Department of Homeland Security through, through Mike Shepard. Uh, so I thought uh, maybe you all aren't completely familiar with combs, so first I'd just briefly review what a frequency comb is and what it can bring to spectroscopy and how it might fit into uh, other broadband spectroscopy approaches that you know. And then to give you a flavor at least of some of the different ways we're looking at using the combs, I was just going to sort of quickly go through four different examples of systems that use combs. Uh, the first is a dual comb spectrometer, which is, uses the full accuracy and resolution of the comb. Uh, and we've done that at 1.5 and 3 microns, but it maybe it's too much resolution for some systems. Uh, the second is basically taking a comb and combining it with a tunable laser spectrometer using an existing QCL. Uh, we're trying to there get the sensitivity of a tunable laser and the frequency, accuracy, and precision of a comb. The last two are really, we're moving out to the mid-infrared using high power mid-infrared comb sources. Uh, in one case, looking at both trace gases with broad and narrow features at the same time using a high resolution dispersive spectrometer. And then finally getting to some explosives, doing a preliminary work looking at standoff detection of explosives. Uh, there, initially just with a normal monochrometer, but eventually we'll move toward a dispersive spectrometer there. Um, so with that, I wanted to talk about what a frequency comb is. And to do that, I have to first talk about a passively mode lock laser, because basically all frequency combs really rest on a passively mode lock laser. And I show a sort of ring laser here, but basically what these put out are is light at the different modes of the laser. Uh, however, it's different than just a multi-mode laser because these are all locked in phase with each other. And therefore, what you actually get out, they, well, they constructively inter interfere to get pulses of light. And so we get out of this laser is just a stream of pulses that are short and they're separated by the rep rate of the laser, which is the round trip time around the cavity. Um, this is a time domain picture. In the frequency domain, of course, each of these modes, uh, well, I plotted intensity and frequency here, each of these modes appears as a delta function. Uh, again, they're separated by the rep rate of the laser. And you can see why you get the name frequency comb, because these maybe look like the teeth on a comb. And if there were no noise, you'd in fact already be at a frequency comb here. Um, the distinction is that a comb, and this distinction is sometimes blurred, but is a comb is a stabilized mode lock laser. And so here's the same system putting out the pulse train. And in the frequency domain, we have these teeth. I show more of them now, which are the modes of the laser. And it was a real realization by Ted Hedge and Jan Hall, that, for which they got the Nobel Prize in 2005, that this comb structure is going to stay. And what noise is going to do is just cause it to fluctuate, keep the same basic structure, but expand or move around. And it's sufficient to lock down two degrees of freedom here to lock down the entire comb. And there's lots of ways to lock it down. The way, the sort of standard and original way to do that is to lock the spacing of the teeth by locking the rep rate of the comb by just feeding back to the cavity length. So that pins down the spacing. The comb can still slide back and forth. And that motion is described by an offset frequency, which is sort of the tooth you'd get if you march down to zero. But it turns out if you have a broad enough continuum here, and by maybe you've expanded in nonlinear fiber, you can detect the offset frequency as well. And, and now basically the frequency of any tooth here is given by the sum of the offset frequency plus a big integer times the rep rate or the spacing of the teeth. And you've linked the optical frequencies to the RF, which is very powerful for metrology. Uh, and you also now have a 
light source with many well-defined frequencies. So that makes, of course, a number of people for a while now have been then interested in using this uh, for sensing and spectroscopy because now you have this up to a million essentially CW oscillators, very narrow linelets, well-known frequencies, you know, all traveling together in a, in a laser beam so you can go through a long distance or do standoff detection. Uh, and in fact, combs cover a wide range of, of optical frequencies now. The, the original one was the Thai Sapphire that went from 500 to 1 micron. It was followed by the erbium centered at 1.5 microns and ytterbium fiber lasers like this. And now I sh should add it on here. Thulium lasers are out centered around 2 microns. Uh, for the purposes of spectroscopy, of course, you want to push out to the mid-infrared and there's a lot of work on that now often starting with these laser sources and moving out here through difference frequency generation or supercontinuum generation or optical parametric oscillators. Um, I should say there's obviously some challenges. The, you have a lot of power in these combs, but there's a lot of modes. So you have a low power per tooth, which limits your sensitivity through shot noise, if nothing else. As I'll show in a minute, these spectra are not flat. And of course, we're still talking about uh, a laser and, and a, uh, has complications and expense associated with that. Um, here's a basic picture of some combs. I sort of have a diagram of them up here and, and the spectra down here. This is wavelength and power per comb tooth mode. Uh, as I said, the Thai Sapphire was the original one. Here's a typical, you have a Thai Sapphire gain chip and a free space cavity. And the, uh, the blue curve here is a high power 10 gigahertz laser. And the, the black is a one gigahertz Thai Sapphire laser. And you can see they cover this sort of region and can get up to 10 or even 100 microwatts per comb tooth, but with a highly variable uh, spectrum. Here's the ytterbium uh, KYW laser and then a erbium fiber laser uh, shown out here in green. Uh, it looks like this. It's a ring. It can either be fiber and free space or all fiber. Uh, its power per tooth is lower here, but it's it's flatter than these others, this particular spectrum, but it still has a 10 dB variation. So that's something that has to be dealt with in, in spectroscopy. So we want to use these for spectroscopy. So obviously we're going to take the comb and either bounce it off a surface or go through a gas. And just with any broadband spectroscopy, after it passes through, if there's molecular absorption, the teeth will be attenuated accordingly. For the first system I'll talk about, I guess it really, in a little bit of a second, the, uh, we can actually resolve the attenuation on a per comb tooth mode. But for many of them, that's excessive resolution, and you'd rather trade that for sensitivity, and then we kind of group these teeth together. Um, so I wanted to take a step back and talk about combs in the more broader sense of broadband spectroscopy. So I sort of tried to draw a matrix of the different possibilities with sources here uh, and the interaction region here, which might be a gas or a surface, and then different ways to resolve the spectrum, some of which you're probably perfectly familiar with over here. Uh, in terms of sources, I've separated a supercontinuum source and a frequency comb source. Supercontinuum source looks very similar. It might start with, a, except it starts with a picosecond laser and does some significant nonlinear broadening. Give you a very high power source that's perhaps flat, but it doesn't have the comb structure and it can be noisier. Uh, frequency comb will start with a femtosecond laser and broaden out and will have the comb structure and less noise, but maybe more power variability. And of course, there's kind of a, a continuum between these uh, depending on the source and the distinction can get a little blurred. Uh, in terms of detection techniques, of course, there's FTIRs and typical grading spectrometers. And then there's some other options that are available because of the laser nature of the source, which sort of opens up some new possibilities. Most of, you know, most of the different possible mix and match things that here have been demonstrated in the literature. Uh, I'm going to focus on the subset, uh, uh, basically mainly involving the comb, although show, show one swept laser, either through a multipass cell or off a surface with these sort of different three detection techniques. Um, this is a wide area of research, and I should mention that one of the co-authors on this paper is also giving an uh, invited talk later on work down the street at Jilla using frequency combs in the mid-infrared, and, and that's the, this afternoon in, in room 307B. So the, the first technique I want to talk about is coherent dual comb spectroscopy. 
Uh, the idea is sort of shown here. We have a comb. In this case, it's a fiber comb. So it shows a, a ring of fiber laser here with some erbium dope fiber. And it puts out this comb now, drawing all those red arrows here, that go through the gas sample and some of them get absorbed. And we want to measure that absorption on each tooth in this case. Say it's a, a small molecule. Um, to do that, we bring in a second comb, which is a local oscillator comb. And we have exquisite control on how well these two systems are phase locked with respect to each other. So we can arrange it so this local oscillator comb is a similar comb structure, but a slightly bigger spacing. So its teeth walk off the source comb teeth. Now, of course, this is, this is just like CW laser heterodyne spectroscopy. If you have two laser frequencies that are near each other, when they beat on a photodiode, you get an RF tooth out. And each pair of these teeth does this. So this pair gives this RF, this pair gives this RF beat, and so on. And out of this photo detector, we get a comb of RF frequencies. And if the source comb has been attenuated here and here, then the RF teeth are attenuated here and here. And in fact, if there's a phase shift on these teeth, you actually see the phase shift in the RF too. And if you look at the actual data, we really do resolve the RF teeth like this. They really are narrow spikes. And also, because we can do this phase locking very well, we know the exact optical frequencies here, and we know exactly how they map to the RF domain. We have an exact mapping between the optical and RF. So this is an approach that really is, is sort of unique in that it can really access the response on each tooth by each tooth, and it uses the full accuracy and resolution of the comb, which, which in some cases is needed and, and maybe some cases not. Um, there have been a lot of proof of principle experiments in the last uh, year or two we wanted to push out to make, see how practical a system this could be, at least for trace gases. Uh, so we basically took a comb and we broadened its spectrum to cover from 1.3 to 1.7 uh, microns. This is a 45 terahertz span. And we put a mixture of gases in a multipass cell. Again, because we're going over a broad span and onto a single photo detector, there is a multiplex hit in detection, so we have to average for a while. And we do that coherently using an FPGA, an approach that's similar to co-adding uh, interferograms and FTIRs. And here's an example of some of the data. This is spectral intensity versus either wavelength or frequency. And the general envelope here is the uh, spectrum of the comb. And you can see the little teeth coming down or the absorption of the different gases. Uh, this is at 100 megahertz point spacing. Each point is known to 10 kilohertz. So there are about half a million spectral elements across here. Again, and, and the SNR is about 1,000 on average and much higher than that at the peaks. So to get that kind of SNR and number of points for a single detector, we have to average for a while. Uh, we can take the natural log of that and get rid of the spectrum to get the actual absorption spectrum of the gases, get rid of the laser spectrum. So here's that same data, and we had methane and CO2 and acetylene and, and water. Again, there's half a million points across here, which is a little hard to appreciate until you start blowing it up. Here's the central, looks like a dense cluster of lines here, and you can see we can actually resolve this sort of Q branch of methane here. Um, and we can expand it further, and here's an isolated line, and it has a perfect Doppler profile. And we sampled that each of these dots represents the response at a single comb tooth with 10 kilohertz resolution and accuracy. You can see there's sort of bumps down here at the baseline. Again, we had a signal noise ratio over 1,000, so that's not noise. Most of those are actual uh, hot bands that are poking up out of the baseline. Um, this is in the near infrared. Uh, we wanted to at least do a proof of principle out in the mid infrared where the uh, gas lines are stronger. So we can take the same setup and use periodically pulled lithium niobate in a one micron laser to shift our comb from 1550 out to 3.4 microns. And then we looked at methane, and here's the, and we sort of scanned across the methane uh, new three band, and you can see the absorption dips here, and actually, if I blow it up, maybe you can see it better. Uh, absorption dips here, and as I mentioned earlier, we also get phase, so you can measure the phase response which is a nice kind of unique feature of this to actually directly measure the phase of the, of the gas response. Um, so this works well if you're trying to do very high resolution uh, work. As I said, the sensitivity, um, and, and it's nice because it's a single point detector, it does need a second comb. Uh, you can get broad coverage. Um, there is a multiplex hit to the sensitivity because you're doing all this packing this onto one photodiode. 
So the second system I'll talk about is, is trying to take, uh, combine this with a normal swept laser system. We had a quantum cascade laser, and basically we're going to use that to probe the gas, but if you're sweeping that fast, you don't really know what frequency it's at very well, particularly if it's outside and being bumped around. So we have a comb to really interrogate the instantaneous frequency of the QCL. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with, with Daylight Solutions that make a nice uh, external cavity quantum cascade laser, and the particular one we used is at four and a half microns, shown here. So again, the idea is to just send the QCL signal through, through a gas, say, or off a surface, and track its frequency by beating it against a cone, and keep the sensitivity of the quantum cascade laser and the accuracy and precision of the cone. Um, and this is very similar to what you'd normally say you do with an etalon or gas cell, it's just that here we have the absolute calibration of the comb, and you don't quite have as many trade-offs in terms of, of frequency resolution and speed. You can sort of get it all in one, one go with the comb. The problem we have is that the QCL is at 4.5 microns and our comb is at 1 to 2 microns. So here's the QC, this is frequency, here's the QCL down here and the comb's up here and they don't overlap. Uh, so we borrowed a technique from the Italian group here, basically combine them in Piplin and the QCL mixes with this part of the comb to generate a new comb out here through difference frequency generation. And, this, and then we can attenuate this lower part of the comb in the QCL, and we're left with two combs, the original one from this, and an upshifted comb that has all the frequency properties of the QCL. And when these beat together, that beat frequency will tell us what the QCL frequency is. And we can set, in fact, the QCL can be moving rapidly, and we can track its frequency by tracking its crossing as this comb crosses this one, and getting a good value of the instantaneous frequency of the QCL the quantum cascade laser. Uh, here's a measurement. This is, these lasers sweep about a second across the, their bandwidth. Uh, this technique could actually deal with a laser that swept much faster. Um, they're normally linear sweep, linear sweep. Here's the residuals that can be you know, up to 10 gigahertz with a sort of gigahertz fuzz on it, which is just because you're sweeping a laser. This isn't uh, specific to this laser. It happens with any swept laser. Um, and so we can calibrate all that out and know the instantaneous frequency of the QCL while we're doing the spectroscopy. Uh, this is just a blow up of a 200 hertz uh, oscillation. So we've done that in N2O, here's the typical spectrum and here's when we fit out the gas etalons and we're basically measuring 86 lines uh, with well under a megahertz resolution and accuracy on each of the lines in, in under a second. Um, can blow one up. This is three lines that are fit. There's a slight bump in the residuals here because this gas cell had a little bit of air leak in. But basically we can measure line centers, which is something this is interested in, but also basically you can keep this frequency axis essentially perfect even during the fast sweep of the laser. Um, so that was the goal here, was to see if we could just combine these features of the comb and a swept laser. Um, the bandwidth coverage here is obviously limited by the laser and you are sweeping. Uh, but the sensitivity improvement is, is much better than the dual comb. The next two I want to move more further out than mid-infrared. These are using mid-infrared combs. Uh, the first one is doing this for, for trace, some trace gases and will detect it with a high resolution so-called VIPA spectrograph. Um, this is based on some earlier work by, by Scott Didums and collaborators uh, done in the near-infrared with a fiber free, uh, sorry, Thai sapphire comb at three gigahertz, which went, say, here through an iodine cell. And the, what they were trying to do here is resolve the individual teeth again. So they went into a, a VIPA, a virtual image phase array, which is really just an etalon at an angle. And what that happens is then if you image the back plane of this, you get individual spots, which have a one gigahertz resolution. Uh, they wrap around with the free spectral range of the etalon, which is 50 gigahertz. Uh, so you got to undo that by crossing it with a grating. So this is like a cross to shell spectrograph. It's a technique that's, you know, perhaps common in different forms of spectroscopy, but here you're doing very high resolution, and you take this crossed image and you put it on a CCD, and now each pixel here has a specific frequency associated with it, which we can calibrate out. And the dark pixels, which are blue here, represent absorption by iodine. So the, the goal is to 
take this and move this technique out in the mid infrared to do this massive sort of parallel broadband detection with a 2D focal plane array. Uh, to do this, they started with the ytterbium fiber laser, which I'm just drawing as a box here, but that's a fairly significant system with a two and a half watts and short pulses coming out. And think of it again as a comb. Uh, they took part of the light and just went past straight through, and part of it they put into a photonic crystal fiber and Raman shifted the light out to 1.1 to 1.6 microns, combined it with the original beam in Piplin, periodically pulled lithium niobate, and did difference frequency generation to finally get light in the 3 to 4.5 micron range. Had about 100 milliwatts of power. And then the idea is to put that through, a, in this case, a gas cell and do this 2D spectroscopy. The problem is, this is now on the verge of existing, but at the time this didn't exist in the mid-infrared. So it gets a little more complicated to do this demonstration. They had to actually upconvert by combining with one micron light uh, going through Piplin uh, and then back to the same spectrometer I, I showed in the previous slide. And if they do that and look at, say, methane and take out all the background, you end up with a methane signature in this 2D plane, where again, where each pixel represents a wavelength and these bright spots represent uh, methane absorption. So it's a little hard to see what's going on here, but they can untangle this, take this 2D image and extract the wavelength and come back around to a spectrum, uh, which is shown here. This is the uh, new three branch of methane. This is P, the Q, and the R branches. And this was taken under the conditions shown here with a 1.4 gigahertz resolution, which means actually it's averaging over uh, about 14 comb modes and the corresponding Hytran is shown here, and they at least did a preliminary test of sensitivity. This isn't optimized because of the upconversion and the camera speed, but it's, it's showing that you can do this sort of broadband detection and retain very high resolution. Uh, you can see there's good agreement between the methane and, and the Hytran model. Uh, the idea was to take this and show you could use it, uh, we're looking maybe at uh, you know, could you use this to look at, say, trace gases of the headspace above C4 or something? And so we took a mixed spectrum, which I just show here. You can see it's a broad spectrum with broad features and narrow lines. And this was done by mixing several different constituents. Uh, these uh, three are things that might be found above C4, and this is uh, accidental water that's there. And they each have their individual spectra, and if you add them up, you get the total spectra that was observed. So the nice thing about this is you're measuring both these broadband spectral features. And at the same time, you can see the narrow water lines. So you're using the high resolution of the system to essentially reject these narrow water lines that would otherwise bleed out and distort these broader spectra. Uh, so that's the, this, this third example. So here we're using the comb and the gas cell in this 2D system. A 2D system is maybe no more complicated than a second comb, but it has significant advantages in that you're now doing the detection on multiple pixels, so you don't take the same multiplex hit to sensitivity. And as I said, there's an effort now to move this out toward the, uh, uh, toward the mid-infrared region. So the last one is finally getting to, to standoff detection of explosives, which is just to try to take this similar sort of source and bounce it off a surface and look, collect the light out here uh, uh, eventually with this sort of system, but for now with just a monochromator. Uh, this was uh, done by in Scott Dim's group by Tyler Neely and Laura Glandorf, Glandorf Nugent. And, uh, sorry, this slide, I'm gonna skip over this slide. Uh, well, since I'm here, I didn't know this was in here. This is the ytterbium fiber source I mentioned earlier. You can see it's partly free space, partly fiber laser with a double clad amplifier and you get out huge powers. So it is, Particularly this part is taking advantage of some telecom components, but it is a um, you know, fancy Moldock laser. It's at one micron, and what we want to do is use this, they want to do is use this now instead of doing difference frequency generation to pump a optical parametric oscillator, which is a piece of piplin and some mirrors, uh, and get mid-infrared light out. Uh, it goes from one point, goes from about uh, three to four and a half microns again I apologize, this really got messed up. There's a spectrum here. <laughs> so a picture of a spectrum here showing different, depending on the setting, different uh, light from three to four and a half microns of about 200 nanometers uh, width. And in this case, it's about half a watt of power. So it's quite a bit of power for this sort of system. We want to at least 
try looking at some explosives. Uh, uh, this was a sort of list of ones we wanted to look at. Ideally, of course, you can probably rarely read this, but ideally you want to look out at 7.5 or 8 to 12 microns. For now, with that LPL, this source is at 3.5 microns, uh, and eventually we want to move out to the long wavelength, but for now we wanted to they wanted to see what kind of signature could you see more of the CH band at 3.3 .3 microns. And looking at samples similar to this, where some drops of RDX were initially put on a gold mirror and later on a different uh, sample. So to try to stand off to at least sort of get a feeling for the type of signals we could get, uh, here's the mid-infrared source. Went through a chopper, there were about 100 milliwatts after that that went off the sample. The specular reflection went off here and the diffuse reflection was collected by a telescope and directed now to a monochromator and a point detector, uh, eventually to this 2D array. Um, this is the system, this is the telescope, here's the monochromator. Uh, this is the three and a half meter throw here with a telescope and, and this green spot is the uh, it's a trace beam showing where the mid-infrared beam hits, the mid-infrared source is off the page here. Um, so here finally, sorry, is the, the spectrum of the laser it can three different settings. It's ranging from 2.8 to 3.3 microns. And this is what they get without any, uh, just background light without the explosives there. If you go and illuminate the spot with the HMX, you get this and stitch together the spectral response for each of these in terms of the relative reflectance. You get this sort of broad shaped thing and for PETN this and for tetral this. So they're, Shapes are very different. There's peaks and valleys, which is the good news, and there's plenty of signal, which is good. Um, RDX has a much steeper uh, uh, spike right in the, in the central region corresponding to this sort of wavelength range. Uh, so they wanted to go on and, and look at how sensitive this is to angle and spots. So they set up a sample with one, two, and five drops of RDX, and they looked at both the angle of eight and 16 degrees. And again, at five drops, here's this RDX with the spike in the middle. Uh, the bad news, well, there's a little bit of a spike at 16 degrees, but it's come down. Um, as the drops go down, you, you see the features here, but they start to be dominated by the, the sort of lower, uh, broader features maybe of the substrate. This isn't the ideal surface. It's a gold mirror, so there isn't much light coming back. Most of it's speculatively reflected off. So they moved on to look at a coupon sample uh, from this from Greg Gillen. Again, of RDX. So there's a painted aluminum here. And the middle is RDX. And firstly, they looked off at the edge at the paint. Again, now at 16 degrees. And you get this sort of valley and kind of featureless structure in the middle. Sorry, this is heavily animated. In the middle where there's RDX, you start to now see this again, the spike that comes up in the middle. Um, and at the, uh, a different point, you see the spike again. So there's some at least consistency across the sample at different points with the, the spike coming up. It is shifted compared to what it was on the gold mirror. So you have this problem that's been observed before for standoff detection that uh, uh, you know, the spectra are going to be very dependent on the substrate and the angle. And, and, and so there's a whole matrix that needs to be figured out. Again, the good news is there's plenty of signal. And, and maybe combining this with going further out in the infrared, you can start to develop a real, a more of a library. Um, so these are the, I guess that was the fourth example. So I've kind of gone through four different examples. And as I said, there are others. And, and Florian Adler has a talk this afternoon. Um, this last one, we're basically using a very high power source. And we're, it's almost more important, it's a high power collimated laser source because the spectroscopy in either of these, the, the resolution is provided by the detection system, whereas up here it's provided more by the comb itself. So there's a range. Up here maybe you're looking at narrow lines of, of, of small molecules and you really want the high resolution. Down here you're willing to trade that more for, trade the resolution for sensitivity because you don't need the narrow line, uh, uh, distinction of the narrow lines. You don't need to measure the narrow lines other than to maybe reject them. So uh, summarize, uh, combs offer this interesting possibility of broad bandwidth and, and access to diverse wavelengths. You don't necessarily have to stay in one band. You could combine them. If you need it, you have very high accuracy and precision. And you can combine it with detection techniques that have no moving parts, unlike an FTIR. Um, 
There's a nice collimated laser beam, so it's compatible with long distances through gases or standoff. And depending on your technique, you can get good sensitivity. I showed a couple of demonstrations in the, well, there have been a number in the visible and near-infrared, and, and people are now moving out for the mid-infrared and eventually to the long-wave infrared, uh, both for high-precision spectroscopy and to try to develop it into a more practical tool. And I think this is a real push that's happening, you can see, in the research. And, and you get high power probably through OPOs and maybe cascaded OPOs. Uh, and that's really what the future direction is here. Thulium combs at two microns and long wave IR OPOs will push uh, even further out. And people will continue to push toward practical demonstrations on surfaces or outdoor air. And, and obviously, I really put it here, but once it's sort of converged on a system, we have to figure out how to make it you know, robust and, and relatively inexpensive. Um, huh, there should be a picture of Boulder in here. But in addition to the co-authors, we've benefited from a, a number of uh, collaborators in the greater community for Combs. Uh, thank you. Well, I'll take one question while we get our next speaker set up. No, I, I, well, Scott Didham's in that group did it, and I don't, no, not, not a quantitative comparison. I mean, they all have the problem of delivering that much power to the source. I'd imagine here it's a little less, but, but yeah, it's a good question to compare these all, and I haven't done it. Okay, well, so